Welcome to AP Chemistry at Hananiga High School. Today we'll be taking a look at Arrhenius practice. Uh, so using Arrhenius equations and from data that you can use in Arrhenius, Arrhenius equation problems, what other types of questions can be asked. So for the question number one, experimental values for the temperature dependence of the rate constant for the gas phase reaction, NO plus O3, which is ozone, yields NO2 plus O2 are as follows. Notice they're giving us temperature and K values. Um, I know here it shows an uppercase K, but it has really a lowercase K, and that's an important distinction. Um, equilibrium that we're going to be looking at in the next few chapters is an uppercase K, so this should clearly be a lowercase K whenever you're doing these. If you have to, draw it in a lowercase cursive K, um, and that'll always make that distinction, because that's an important difference on the test. Rate constants, lowercase italics K. Equilibrium constants, uppercase K. Okay, show all work and pay particular attention to sig figs and units when reporting your answers. A, is this reaction fast or slow? Justify your answer. Now, when you take a look at your data, there is a hint as to whether this reaction is going to be fast or slow. Remember by differential rate law, the rate would equal the rate constant K times the concentrations. So obviously the bigger the value of K is, the bigger your rate would be. Well, large rates are fast rates. Think of going 60 miles an hour versus going 10,000 miles an hour. Larger number, faster speed. So in this particular reaction, you really should be saying that because these Ks are large, it's going to be a fast reaction. Now, one thing you need to be careful of when you're doing this, always tie those Ks to that temperature when you're doing this. Otherwise, you won't get full credit in the AP problem. So is this reaction fast or slow? It is fast. And for your justification, you need to say, now if you look at these K values, remember, subtracting 273 gets us back to degrees Celsius. So basically, at these low temperatures, so here we have lower temperatures. At these lower temperatures, we have a large K. We have very large K values. And remember, make sure this is clearly a lowercase K. Boy, that looks kind of odd there. So if your lowercase italics K doesn't look good, write it like that. Make sure it's a clear lowercase K. So very large K values. Okay, second question, part B. What is the overall order of this reaction? Justify your answer. Now, most people that get this wrong will be sucked into looking at the overall reaction up here. And what they'll basically see is, oh, that looks like it's a simple reaction. So if that was an elementary reaction, this would be second order. It would be bimolecular. The problem is they never specify that this is an elementary step. So we can't use that angle. That's where most people go wrong. What you need to use is this right here. This is something we talked about in class. We made a connection for this. So notice this is molarity upside down and seconds. So what we really have here is 1 over molarity seconds. So what overall order will this be? Well, once you see this, that should be familiar to you. Remember, the purpose of the units in the K value was to get our final answer, our rate, to molarity per second. So remember what we're trying to do here is a rate is going to be a molarity per second, and that's going to equal our K value times some concentration data. So the sole purpose of our units and our K value is to take this concentration data that we have here and cancel those units to give us molarity over second because that's what a rate would be. Well, if you recall, In this particular situation, then, if I have to end up with molarity over second as a rate, so since rate equals a molarity over second, what K value units would give me a certain order molarity per second? Well, my question really here is really going to be then, what is that unknown order? Well, if I want to get to molarity on top and seconds on the bottom, and I know I've got molarities here, um, what overall order would give me, in this particular case, I've got 
So let me expand this. My k units here are going to be k, which would be 1 over molarity second times some concentration order. Well, I have to have, it looks like, seconds on the bottom, that's good. So we're okay there. I've got a molarity on the bottom and I've got to have a molarity on top. Well, the only way that can happen is if I have a molarity squared here. So in this particular case, my question mark here, if concentrations are molarity, what power would give me that? It's got to be a molarity squared. Then my units would cancel here at two molarity per second. So the answer would be, it's got to be second order. And it comes from my units here. So this is my justification. So that's the idea. The units of your K value tell you what your overall order is. Okay, C, what is the energy of activation to this reaction? We're really get into, getting in here to the meat of the question. Now, up top we have temperature in Kelvin, which is good. And we have K values. And what we need to understand is, in the Arrhenius, Arrhenius equation, what is our linear relationship that we're dealing with? Well, remember, the Arrhenius equation is the ln of K. So what we're looking at, we're going to use this several times here. ln of K. Did it again here. I looked at that uppercase K. Remember, this should be a lowercase k here. So ln of k is going to equal the negative of E sub A over R times 1 over T plus the ln of A, which is our frequency constant. So that's the Arrhenius equation. Well, you notice this is in the y equals mx plus b form, which is really useful for what we're looking at here. Energy of activation, then, is related to the slope of our equation generated by graphing the ln of k versus the inverse of the Kelvin temperature. So that's what I need to do. Remember, one of the things we talked about is when we're doing our graphs, we're always going to have t or t here. That means our ln of k is going to go over here. So if we graph the ln of a k versus the reciprocal of temperature in this particular case, we should get a straight line. And the slope of that line is going to be related to our energy of activation. So what we really need to do is graph this. Now, all these points that are up here, if you take the inverse temperature and the ln of k, you're going to have x and y values. Now, technically, ln of k would be our y values, and these would be our x values. But if you took the ln of k and the inverse of temperature, all these points up here should be valid. So what we really should be able to do is find out two of these points and do a change in y over change in x, and that should give us our slope. That's what you do on my test where you don't have access to your graphing calculator. If you've got access to your graphing calculator, the quick, easy way to do this, let me get this so I can see it here. I have plugged this information into my graphing calculator. And this was my equation for my line. So the slope of this thing is going to equal that right there. So I know slope equals the negative of the E sub A over R. Remember, R is our ideal chaos constant. We want the energy one here, so we're looking at 8.31. So we plug this into the equation and solve. So E sub A is going to equal the negative of the slope times R. And we know the slope from our equation here is negative 1,435 point whatever, whatever, ever. Remember, we're making that, multiplying that by negative 1, so that's going to be 1, 4, 35.715. I just want to carry a bunch of extra significant digits here. Times R, which is going to be 8.31. When you plug those into the calculator, your energy of activation ends up equaling 11.9, and that would be in kilojoules per mole. What you're actually going to get here, because 8.31 deals with joules per mole, would be 11,900. So I'm going to write that as 11.9 
picture that's clear there, kilojoules per mole. Now, the next question, D, says, what is the value of K when the temperature is 455? Remember, up here we have an equation for our relationship. Now, they're giving us a T value, so we know this. We just calculated E sub A, so we know that. We know R because it's a constant. They're giving us in this particular case, our temperature, and by our graph right here, the ln of A, that equals 28.07. So we also know this. That's our y-intercept. So we know everything in this equation except for k. So plug in your numbers and solve for k. That's really what we're going to do here. So when you go to set this thing up, it's the ln of k is going to equal Energy of act and negative energy of activation over R. Well, that's just our slope. So I'm going to plug that in for this whole value. So that would be, if I erase this so you can see it more clearly, that's going to be negative 1435.715. And that's going to be times inverse temperature. So 1 over 455 Kelvin plus our y-intercept, which is 28.07103. That should be far enough. All you really have to do here is plug that in and find out what the ln of k is. Now, you need to understand what we're solving here when we do this is the ln of k. So when I find the ln of k in this particular problem, I'm going to get 24.9156. Well, if that's the natural log of k, how do we get k? Remember, to get rid of natural log, you take e to the x of both sides, and that would give us k. So what we're really doing here is taking e to the 24.7156, and that would give us a k value of 6.62. To the tenth. Let me get this out of the way so we can see this a little bit better. And our units of K, remember this thing is second order. We talked about that right there. It's from the table up here. So that would be 1 over molarity seconds. So that is our K value. Now, to see this a little bit better. You need to extend my page here just a little bit, which is going to make it a little bit smaller, but that will give us enough room to see E. What is the temperature when the rate constant has a value of 22.5 times 10 to the ninth, and that would be 1 over molarity seconds? So they're giving us a K value in this case. Well, we go right back to the equation we just used a second ago, but now they're giving us K. So we're going to take the ln of K, which was given as 22.5 times 10 to the ninth, and that's 1 over molarity seconds. And that's going to equal our slope, which is negative 1435.715 times 1 over the temperature. And to that, we're going to add our y-intercept, 28.07103. So in this case, do your algebra, solve for t. We end up with t is going to equal 339K. So that's how problem one looks with justifications and answers. Okay, question number two says for the following data were collected for a reaction. Now notice they're giving us K's and temperatures, but be careful. In this particular case, they're giving us temperatures in degrees Celsius. So always look at what your units are. So I know I've got to do two things here. I need to find the ln of K, and I need to find the reciprocal of the temperature, but it's got to be in Kelvin. So I need to establish those two things. So add 273 to each of these, and then take the reciprocal of everything. Over here, take the natural log of all of these. And once I've got that, remember, since we're dealing with the Arrhenius equation here, it's a linear relationship between the ln of k and the inverse of the Kelvin temperature. Inverse Kelvin temperature is going to go on our 
x-axis and the ln of k will go on our y-axis uh, y and we plot my points, we should end up with a linear expression that looks like this. Now, I've taken um, and already done the calculations for this, so it should be quick to see what our uh, linear relationship actually is. Before we get to that, part A says, is this reaction fast or slow and justify your answer? Now, this is similar to what we looked at before. Now, remember, with this question, you need to tie the temperature to it. And when you look at those temperatures in degrees Celsius, those are very high. So what you'd basically say is this reaction is going to be slow. We know that because we've got small values for K here, but remember we need to tie it to temperature, so we would say at these high temperatures, the K is small, meaning a small rate. Okay, second part B, what is our energy of activation? Here's where I said um, you have to graph your ln of K versus the reciprocal of the Kelvin temperature. And I've done that. Let me get this in a form that we should be able to see it here. Okay. So I've graphed that. And here's my y equals mx plus b form. I've got a slope of negative 9,515 and change. And remember, just like before, the slope of this line is going to equal negative E sub A over R. And remember, use your appropriate R value. So E sub A is going to equal the negative of the slope times R. So all you have to do is plug in numbers here. Now, it's the negative of the slope, which is a negative 9515.6723, that should be plenty of sig figs, times R, and the R we're going to use is the 8.31, remember the one dealing with joules. We plug that in and round to three significant digits, so we do our calculation here, and you should end up with, and remember this is going to be in joules, I'm going to convert to kilojoules since it's a large number, so I end up with 79.1 kilojoules per mole for this uh, for this calculation. Remember, it was really 79,100 joules per mole. We're converting it to kilojoules per mole. Now, next question, what is the value of K when the temperature is 640? Now, remember, the basic idea behind that is exploiting the linear expression of this line. So that's where the um, equation that we use for Arrhenius equation, the ln of key, or K equals the recip or the negative E sub A over R times one over the Kelvin temperature plus the ln of A. So if I've got an equation and I know everything but the K value, I can end up solving for K. So I plug in my values and what I get here is the ln of K is going to equal Remember, my slope was 95.15, negative, oops, 6.723. That's going to be multiplied by 1 over the inverse of my Kelvin temperature. And that's going to be added to my y-intercept, which is 7.89528. Remember that comes right off of this information right here. Now, when I actually plug all these numbers in and calculate, remember I'm actually getting not my answer, but the ln of the answer I want. This is going to give me the ln of k. So this ends up ln of 6.9, negative 6.972948. And when I get rid of the ln by taking the e to both sides, I end up getting for K as my final answer, 9.37, remember that's a 9.37 times 10 to the negative fourth, and that would be, since it's overall second order, 1 over molarity squared, remember, same value as, or 1 over molarity seconds, same values I had for K's up there. 
So that would be my part D. Now I need to get a little room here to do the next one, part D. What is the temperature? So same relationship as before. I'm going to use this expression, which I generated from my line. And in this particular case, I'm going to know the K. So the ln of K, which was 50.5 times 10 to the negative fourth. And that is, oh, just to be more careful here, units would be 1 over molarity seconds. And that is going to equal my negative E sub A over R, which is basically my slope. So the slope here is going to equal negative 9515.6723 times 1 over T. Remember, in this case, T is an unknown, plus my y-intercept, which is 7.895. Two eight nine eight. Now, in this particular case, all I have to do is solve for t. But notice, in this case, when I get t, as long as I'm not getting 1 over t, but do the algebra right, you'll get t. When I solve for t, I will have my final answer. So I don't need to do anything else to it, because it just says, what is the temperature? and say anything like, what is the temperature in Celsius? So temperature at which my k would equal that is 222 Kelvin. This last equation here is a little bit different. In question number three, or equation, in question number three, biological reactions nearly always occur in the presence of enzymes as catalyst. The enzyme catalase, which acts on the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide, reduces the energy of activation for the reaction from 72 kilojoules per mole, which is your uncatalyzed energy of activation, to 28 kilojoules per mole at 25 degrees Celsius. The total delta to E for the reaction is negative 204 kilojoules per mole. Now, the first thing it asks you to do is write the balanced equation for the chemical reaction for the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. Now, this is a reaction I've seen a number of different times on the AP test, so this is one you definitely should know. Hydrogen peroxide is H2O2. When that decomposes, it breaks apart into water and oxygen gas in a redox reaction. And this is a reaction I've used many times in labs to generate oxygen for different reactions. Now, that would be the overall unbalanced equation to balance it. Since I have multiple oxygens on the right in sources, 3 to 2, um, the only way I can get this to balance is if I stick a 2 here. That would give me an even number of oxygens on the right, total of 4. So a 2 here, and now I have the balanced chemical re reaction. So that would be the balanced reaction for the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. Now, the first thing we're going to do here is draw what's called a reaction coordinate diagram. Now, that's really a fancy word for the potential energy diagrams you've been seeing in notes and that we've been talking about for several years now. Now, what we're going to have here is a diagram where on this axis we have potential energy. And on the bottom axis here, what we really have is the course of the reaction. So what's happening over time. Now, a couple of things before we start to draw to try and get this somewhat to scale. One thing you should notice here is that overall the delta E is negative 204 kilojoules per mole. Or remember the negative sign in delta E, and this is the same as delta H enthalpy. The negative sign would tell us that we have an exothermic reaction. So at the end, our products are going to be down here below our reactants. So let's say we're starting right about here. And that would be 100, that would be 200. Just to give a rough idea for scale here, my products are starting here. About 200 higher than that would be my, where my reactants start. My unkylized reaction is 72, which is going to be a little less than my 100 mark. And the catalyzed reaction, we can worry about that after we draw it. So we know we're going to start here. This is our baseline. And at the beginning here, we're going to have our reactants. And through the course of the reaction, we're going to make our activated complex. So the reactant here would be H2O2. That's what we have at the beginning. Right up here, we have our activated complex. And then down here, we have our products, which would be water and oxygen. So this is what the reaction would look like through the course of that uncatalyzed reaction. Now, if we have a catalyzed reaction, 
remember it's going to happen more rapidly because we've lowered the energy of activation from 72 kilojoules to 28 kilojoules. Now just to give a rough scale here, it's still going to basically start at the same point. It's still going to end up at the exact same point, but we're going to have a much lower hill in this case, our energy of activation. Now to label our energies here, from this spot to this spot, right there in red, that is going to be our uncatalyzed, make sure I spell this right, uncatalyzed energy of activation. And from that same spot to this spot, that is going to be our catalyzed energy of activation. And the last thing to put in here, remember this is an exothermic reaction, we need our delta E. Our delta E is going to be going from our reactants down to our products here. And delta E is going to be, in this particular case, negative I suppose I should write in our energies everywhere, 204 kilojoules per mole. Our uncatalyzed energy of activation was 72 kilojoules per mole. And our catalyzed energy of activation was 28 kilojoules per mole. So that would be our energy diagram here. And remember, this is called the reaction coordinate diagram, which is a fancy name for it. Now, Part C, what is the activation energy for the uncatalyzed reverse reaction? And then D, what would it be for the other? Well, let's get a little bit more room here to work. So what is the activation energy for the uncatalyzed of the reverse? Now remember, the reverse is exactly as it sounds, starting with products, moving back towards reactants. So in the reverse direction, the uncatalyzed still is the top of that hill, but now remember we're starting from here. So for the reverse situation, we would have the 204 kilojoules per mole to get us to where the reactants were, and then from there we have to go up another 72 kilojoules per mole to get to our top of the hill. So add those two together and we get 276 kilojoules per mole as our energy of activation for the reverse reaction. So what is the energy of activation for the catalyzed? Well, we've still got the 204 kilojoules per mole. And now to get to that top of the blue hill, we only really need to add another 28 kilojoules per mole. So when you add those two together, your, uncatali or your catalyzed energy of activation would be 232 kilojoules per mole. Let me double check to make sure that matches with my numbers. It's always a pain to have to redo these if I make a mistake, which is exactly what I'm doing right now. Those look good. All right. That is the Arrhenius equation.